we're going to do what I call kitchen stuff. This is what we have is a lot of things that you'd normally see in somebody's kitchen. And I know you don't have all of these things in your kitchen, but as you become a medical missionary, you will. These are things that you'll be working with on a frequent basis. Of all of the things with herbology, this is the most fun to me. When I was a little boy, I used to like to get into my mother's cupboards and get things out and concoct and mix and have a lot of fun. In fact, my older sister convinced me that if I would go under the kitchen sink, you know, where the clean cleaners and all that thing, if I'd take some of everything under there and mix it up in a bowl that I would make Crayola crayons and I'd have all 24 colors. Well, I was only four years old, but I ruined almost everything under the sink trying to make crayons. My mother decided it'd be cheaper to buy me a box. But I haven't lost my, my knack for loving to just play around with things, and so this is where I really enjoy. Now, I've got a lot of stuff out here. I'm not going to guarantee you I'm going to do this in the absolutely most logical flow and fashion. If I did it perfectly, everything would work out right. And after we've lectured and studied as long as we have today, I cannot guarantee I'll get this totally organized. I'm not known for being the most organized person, but what I want to try. We've talked all day about things like infusions, decoctions, you know, salves and tinctures and all these kinds of things. Now, I want to go through and explain this and make it all sense to you. So we take it all out of theory and put it down into practice and make, and make something that you can get your hands on. I'm a, I'm a tangible person. The, theory is hard for me. So let's start out with an infusion. An infusion is kind of a fancy way of saying tea, herb tea, okay? But we're working with that. You remember the aerial parts? We talked about the aerial parts. In the aerial parts, we have delicate little volatile oils and, and various substances. And if we would like put them in a kettle and simmer them away for a while, we would evaporate all of those delicate substances off into the universe and we wouldn't have a whole lot of anything therapeutic left. And so we don't want to lose them. So I'm going to demonstrate. Here's some powdered herb. And have you ever dumped powdered herb in with hot water and then had to figure out how you're going to strain it back out again? I am so lazy. I don't like messes, and I don't like cleaning messes up. So I put it in a coffee filter. These little cute ones that are thin and kind of look like a the little nut basket out of the Fisher's assorted nuts or whatever, I just crumple those up. There is another kind that's sold in some of the stores, and they're flat and kind of folded up in a uh, like a triangle. They are terrible. They, nothing flows through them, and you can't get anything to come out. I have a tea bag, folks, just like that. Little stapler, one of these little uh, tea bags, coffee filters, and I don't have to strain anything when I'm done. And so I'm going to pour this into this Pyrex over here because I don't want to have something splatter. I've got some water here that has been simmering away. It is at a boil. I'm going to take it off the heat. I'm going to pour it into here. Pour it over my herb. <clears throat> now the only thing that I cannot do that I normally would like to do is I would like to cover this. Because by not covering it, I'm losing some of the most delicate things off into evaporation. So when you're making your decoctions, I'm not decoctions, but your uh, infusions, remember always to cover them when you're done with them. And this would be ready to be your herbal tea or your infusion as soon as it's cool enough to drink. That was very easy, okay? I'm going to pour some of that over here uh, into this glass. Now I have a cup of an infusion. I'm going to pull some things out of the way so our camera can see what we're doing just a little bit better. Let's make a decoction. Well, what kind of things would we make a decoction out of? Roots, barks, nuts, heavy seeds. Here we're dealing with things that we're going to have to extract the herbal properties out of something that's hard. The chemicals are deep inside of something with a solid body. And I'm not just going to pour a little bit of hot water over top and have it extract out instantly like it did out of that fragile herb. This I'm going to have to simmer for a while. 
And so here I have several choices. You notice I have a root. If I were to just try and put this root in here, I'd have to simmer this thing for probably 30 minutes in order to extract it out. And I'd, I'd try my best to break it up uh, like with a hatchet or, you know, I've taken some of these hard roots and just taken them out on a, on a, a piece of wood and pounded on them with a big hammer to try and break them up and soften them up somewhat. Very pungent, that's OSHA root. Good immune uh, tea there we get out of this. This one happens to be the cat claw plant. And cat's claw comes from South America. It's a good uh, cancer fighter. It's a good blood uh, tonic. And we would make a, a decoction out of this one. <clears throat> and let's just do that just for fun so that we can uh, get started on that one. I'm going to take out from my cup of tea, I'm going to take out uh, of these shredded root particles about the equivalent of a teaspoon. Since I don't like to strain or clean up my messes, my wife will tell you I don't clean up my messes very well. I'm going to drop that in and we're just going to let that simmer for a while. Now that one's not as, as dense and hard as this one. We're using common sense again. That one's shredded up. It's like kind of like, uh, maybe they, looks like the sawdust or a chainsaw maybe made this. You know, the shredded things that fly off your chainsaw chain. So that one's going to be very easy to extract. I would probably simmer this one about 10 minutes, whereas the heavier ones, maybe 30 minutes. And it won't take very long before that'll get out. Now, I didn't say I'm going to boil this. I said, I'm going to simmer it gently. Just, to, you know, the bubbles are going around in there and it's moving just a little bit. Perfect. Uh, something's just barely moving. Now, we're going to come back to that in a few minutes while we talk about a few other things. Tinctures. I talked several times this afternoon about tinctures. Now, you see in my hand a uh, bottle of Potter's 40% alcohol vodka. Uh, I'll give you a little secret. This is only water. I wouldn't dare bring a bottle of real vodka on Hope International Campus. <clears throat> Not for any reason. Not for therapeutic reasons or medicinal reasons. This is water, but you can't tell because it's got, you know, it's clear anyway. The reason that I use this is twofold to make my tinctures. I need a solvent, a, an extraction solvent that's going to preserve. Water would, would be an extraction solvent, but it won't preserve. It'll allow, it'll allow it to rot or mold or mildew or ferment or whatever. I want something that will preserve. I could use vegetable glycerin, but it's a poor extractor. It's a fairly good preservative, but it's a poor extractor. I could use vinegar, which will do both, but it's not nearly as effective. The, vine or the uh, grain alcohol is the best extractor preserver combination in any one particular solvent that we can use. Uh, the alcohol tends, if you use it sublingually, you know, and here I have some super immune drops, you would take this out, um, put a few drops under your tongue sublingually, instantly the stuff is into your blood. Now, the Spirit of Prophecy tells us not to use alcohol, not even in tinctures. So what am I, a hypocrite? <clears throat> okay, I don't want to take this stuff uh, on a, let's say, a daily therapeutic thing and say, okay, today I'm going to take my drops. Every day I'm taking my drops. This can be taken and put into a cup of hot water. You just squirt it in, and in a few minutes, all of the alcohol will evaporate out, and it leaves just the herb in the water. Now, well, why would I do that? Well, let's, let's say you're traveling. You don't want a big, bulky half pound of tea to take along. You're in a motel, you don't have any place to make tea, or you're in various people's houses. The tincture sticks in your pocket, sticks in your purse. All you've got to ask for is a cup of hot water, and almost always somebody will give you a cup of hot water. Or let's say that you have somebody who has asthma. Severe asthma attack comes on just right now. That person's over there just <sighs> gasping for breath. <clears throat> I believe, from what I read in the Spirit of Prophecy, Ellen White says, circumstances alter cases. And sometimes we have to do what we have to do to save a life. 
This would do that because instantly it would be into the blood. The anti if it was an antispasmodic tincture, it would be into the blood and the person would be beginning to, to gain relief. Now how do I want to make the tincture? I want to take some herb and usually I'll make these in a pint jar, like a jelly jar. But since I don't have one of those, I'm just going to put it right into this partial bottle here. I'm a fairly practical person. I'm not the neatest person here, I guess. You just place your herb down in there. And what I would do is I'd fill this to the point where, you see now I have my herb just sitting on top. I would want to see where my herb and my alcohol were sharing space about equally. Now this I've got about 25% herb and 75% alcohol. I would want to fill that up to where I had herb almost all the way down because this is a cut and sifted herb. If I had powdered herb, I don't want to do that. I want to do it about 50%, 50-50. You have to use practical common sense. Cut and sifted is made out of little chunks who are all irregular shaped and they're all kind of at arm's length from one another and so there's airspace in between. You run into a powdered herb, you notice that I would have a whole lot more herb per area than I would because it's all densely packed together and all sifted down into a place. Because what will happen to you is your herb is going to begin to absorb the alcohol. And if you had it all filled up with uh, powdered, it'll absorb it all out and you'll have nothing but clay, like a paste, and you'll have nothing to get any tincture back out of. So you want, you want some extra alcohol. You want to be able to see about uh, a quarter of the alcohol not being absorbed or taken up. And you're going to play some games with this as time goes on. Okay, I don't ha instantly have a tincture. I'm going to shake this and put it in my cupboard and I'm going to do that for 14 days. Every day I'm going to remember to go over and open my cupboard door and take out my tincture bottle and uh, shake this up pretty good and that will help move the solution around and get it done. And in 14 days I can take it out, I can strain it, I can use a cheesecloth, I can use a piece of uh, old pillowcase, I could use one of these. I can strain it however it want to works. These are a little bit hard sometimes because sometimes I don't want to waste one drop and I'm going to wring out a piece of cloth and that would break. So you're probably going to want to use a piece of cloth. An old t-shirt works really great. And then you'll have a tincture that you can take wherever you want to go. Okay, we've been simmering away there for about our 10 minutes and we can turn our heat back down again. I'm going to have to have one thing to dump stuff into that I don't want anymore. We'll just place that off to the side. And you'll notice that we've changed the color of the water somewhat now. Here we have a decoction. Here we have an infusion. You'll notice that many times when you're dealing with herbs, you'll find like in your herb books where it calls for an infusional decoction. What's that? Well, you just mix them together. You have an infusional decoction. <clears throat> That's simple. But what if you didn't want to have to do the work twice? I would have made this one first. I would make my decoction. This is boiling hot, right? I would have taken my little tea bag that I made my infusion and dropped it into here and covered it. I could have saved one container and one job. <clears throat> covered it up, waited till it cooled down, I have an infusional decoction. You can make it either way you want. I make it this way because I'm lazy and don't like to wash dishes. And I don't like to do the job twice. Okay, we're going to set those aside. I'll pour them together and now I have an infusional decoction over in our, in our Pyrex container. Be careful when you dump these things into glass and whatever. You don't want to be making these in aluminum 
I don't mind making them in stainless steel and, I don't, and, and glass is, is okay to make them in. But don't make them in aluminum because aluminum containers are going to be changing some of the uh, effects of what your plants are trying to do in addition to leaching aluminum into it that you don't really want to do. What about um, infused oils? You've heard of infused oils? Okay. You weren't listening because I talked about infused oils twice today. <laughs> I'll dump those out so we have our pan ready to go again. An infused oil, uh, I believe we talked about an infused oil with like the St. John's wort where you want something that you can rub on topically. If you do it with just a water, I mean it evaporates and it's gone. An infused oil, you're, you're going to suspend your herb in the oil and then you're going to be able to get some, some benefit out of it. If you're, if you're going to be doing an infused oil, it's probably not a good idea to try to use this because the oil is not going to flow through nearly as well as the water did. Oil has a much larger molecule. So I'm going to pour a little oil in. Now I'm using olive oil. If you wanted to utilize corn oil, that's fine. If you wanted to use mineral oil and it was only going to be an external application, you could. Now I've got some of this beautiful little oil in the bottom of our, of our pan here. And I think I'll put just a little bit more so we've got more to work with. Let's take an herb and uh, let's make an infused oil out of that one. You just dump it right in. You're going to be using more than if you were making an infusion or a decoction because you want this to be very, very concentrated. Not as much as if you're going to be making a tincture because the oil will begin to absorb in and you'll have a hard time getting it back out. So I'm just going to stir this up quickly in here. Now I've got two options making this infused oil. Um, let's say that I'm in a real hurry. Somebody in my family's got a real itch and I want something for a, for a rash to, to solve this. And I'd take like marigold and chickweed and I, I was going to make a, a rat, uh, cream for a rash or something that was really itchy. I would put this in here and I would keep it almost at a simmer. You know how some Christians almost do the naughty thing but not quite? I mean, you know. That little thing, that's where we want to be with this. That's the only time you want to be almost, folks. And I want to keep it that way at two hours. It would be easier to do this in a double boiler. Much easier to do it in a double boiler because you wouldn't scorch or overheat it. You also have less danger of having a fat fire, you know, like burning the place down. And then you, you get it to the point where like your water is gently simmering your oil is not. That's perfect. If you begin to see the bubbles forming here, you're, you're borderline. In about two hours, you could take and strain this out and utilize it. If I, will, if I wanted to make it the right way and I wasn't in a hurry, I was making this for something in advance, I would place this in a jar and place it in the sun. You know how you make sun tea? The sun is an excellent uh, extraction potentiator. And we'll pull things out and, and place the properties from the herb into the oil. And every day you want to shake that, just like we would be shaking our tincture. We want to shake our infused oil blend every day a couple of times to make certain that the extraction process is flowing evenly. So I'm going to assume that I have done this now for two hours and I'm ready to have an infused oil that I want to use. How many days in the sun? Ten days. Good thing we've got a studio audience here to make certain I tell all the story, isn't it? Okay, there is our infused oil. And 
I would like to strain this. As you're doing this, some people use like little uh, grape presses, wine presses, if they're going to be making large quantities of this type of thing. Uh, I usually just take a little cheesecloth bag or a, or a little pillowcase and take the corner and cut it and put it in and then just kind of wind it up. You're going to get your hands all full of it, but you know, you can wash your hands. There's not a problem with washing our hands, is there? Okay, now that I've got this um, infused oil, I want to show you about making salves. Now, it would be really nice if I could strain this in some way, and I'm going to think for a second. I know I can do this like this. This stuff will float onto the top. Well, I'm going to get a little of the junk in there whether I like it or not, aren't I? I'm going to heat this back up. You know, you've paid big money for salve in the, in the store sometimes and think, man, that's whew, $7 for that. A little one, two ounce tin for that thing. You can make your own. I'm going to show you how to do that real easy. So you're heating up the I'm heating up my infused oil now. And I want to melt something into this that when it cools back down, will thicken it. Now you could do this more than one way. There's more than one way to skin this cat. I could have, instead of used, uh, using this olive oil, if I wanted to make a salve, I could have heated up petroleum jelly like Vaseline. And for my two hours, strained it, and when it cooled back down, I would have a salve. Real easy. But I don't always like to use petroleum-based products with the body. I'd rather use something that's a little more friendly to the body. I'm beginning to hear my stuff hiss just a little bit. I'm going to take a little bit of paraffin for this one. Uh, you could use beeswax. I just didn't happen to be able to get my hands on beeswax. But I'm going to use a little bit of paraffin. And I'm going to let that melt in there. To make a little nicer blend, you go to the uh, pharmacies, you can buy cocoa butter in little tins or little uh, containers. There's two ways to buy this. You can buy, buy the cocoa butter in a little bar like soap. It's hard as a rock. I like to buy it in the little tubs because it's, it's more um, uh, emollient. I think there's a little bit of mineral oil or something in here to soften it down just a little bit. And many times I will like to take just a little bit of cocoa butter and add to that and it makes a little more of an emollient. Now let's say that I couldn't find um, any paraffin. I couldn't find any beeswax. I could just use a little less of the oil and a little more of the cocoa butter and I would still get a salve. In fact, if I couldn't get either of these, now I've got this hot enough that I don't want to start a fat fire in the studio here. I'm going to shut this off. They're melted down very nicely. Let's, let's, uh, let's say that I couldn't find anything. I could just melt just the cocoa butter down and heat it. There's lots of ways to do this. I like to use beeswax and olive oil together, but you, you can't get beeswax and olive oil to mix. When they cool back off, you have two separate things again. So you'll have to use a little bit of the cocoa butter uh, or a little bit of some other fat source. Uh, some people like to use just tallow. You know, a lot of the hippies like to make their own tallow out of their own deer or whatever. You can do that. That'll work as well, too. Now, we'll notice that when I begin to, to uh, pour this off now, that it will cool. And if I've got, got the right amount of um, the cocoa butter and the paraffin in it, that it's actually going to turn into a nice emollient salve that will begin to harden up. Before it does, I don't want this stuff to go rancid on me. I'm going to take some vitamin E oil, and I'm going to drop a few drops in there. We're going to stir that up.
Now, it's very easy to make a mistake with this. So before you get your heart broken, just plan on playing around with it. I like to experiment in the kitchen, so I don't know if you do or not. If you're one of these people that likes to have your recipe turn out right every time, that's fine. One thing that's going to affect whether you've got the right recipe or not is where you live. Now, if you live in uh, Arizona, you're going to want to put in more paraffin or more beeswax. If you live in Alaska, you're going to want to put in less. The reason for that is the temperature, of course. Depending on where you live, it's going to be easier or harder to keep this stuff uh, at the right temperature and right consistency. Now we're going to let these cool down and we're going to start to work on a couple other things while we're doing that. Do you like to make poultices? Poultices can be fun. What do you make poultices out of? Well, you can make poultices out of all kinds of things. Well, let's just say for, uh, for tonight that we want to make a charcoal poultice. Okay. They can be nasty dirty, right? I'm kind of afraid to take the lid off of this little four ounce container of charcoal because the last time I did it went everywhere. I'm going to take a spoon and I'm going to dip in here and I'm going to mix some charcoal and some water. I like to use flaxseed meal with my poultices of charcoal. And when I heat it up just a little bit, it gets a little bit more sticky and makes a jelly-like paste. And that actually uh, tends to draw more and tends to not run all over the place. I utilize that in getting rid of poison ivy one time. I made a great big kettle full of charcoal and flaxseed and made a big jelly out of it and put it on the poison ivy that I had and it drew all of the pain out of it within about 30 minutes and instead of suffering with that I didn't suffer with it at all and I've done it twice. <coughs> yeah. Now I personally do not like messes um, and most of the times when I would make a poultice I'd make a poultice and you, you plop it on and it's now nah, how do I deal with this mess? Well, I'll wrap it up with a rag. Well, that oozes out. I don't like that. Well, cover it up with saran wrap, then wrap it up with a rag. Well, yeah, you can do that. And if you don't have what I'm going to do, that's great. Use what you have. But I like these little, these are called chucks, under pads, incontinence pads. We use these in geriatrics. People are, you know, other people who have a problem with continence, we put them under the bed. We use them delivering babies, whatever. Notice this nice little top layer. You know, and they do this in diapers. This keeps the moisture away from baby's bottom. You know, you, you've watched TV, I think, at least once in your life. <laughs> Maybe even changed a few. You could use a paper towel. You could use just a piece of cloth. Okay. Now, I'm, this is not going to get all over me, and it's not going to get away from me. We're going to take this handy-dandy little stapler. Okay. And you think a little bit about which way you're going to aim the stapler so that the bent-over staples are not on you. They're out there. You always got to do the th some thinking. I'm not going to try and use all of our brother staples up here, so I'm not going to put as many in as I would normally. Normally, I'd really stitch this thing shut, so it's like the Titanic. It's you can it. not leakable. Well, yeah, surge it. You could sew it up if you had no stapler. I sometimes use tape. I tape them up. Now there, I have a, a little poultice that I could put on my arm. Uh, let's say that I have a uh, spider bite there. How am I going to keep that thing there? I got hairy arms. I don't want to get tape. Here's my trusty ace bandage. Just wrap that thing on. If I unrolled this thing, you'd say, yuck. It's had a lot of charcoal poultices on it, and it is stained with, you know, whatever might have leaked out through the time. And then that's very easy to take back off again. 
See, just a little bit has leaked out of there, but I don't have a bunch of this running all over me. I'm going to clean. No, use paper towels, it doesn't leak through like that. There's no leakage at all. The only problem with paper towels is most paper towels will, will break after they've been there long enough. Um, if you're an active person who gets out there and really goes to work, um, you know, when I want to put, put a poultice, lay, say I'm on my knee, I'm going to be down kneeling on that thing. I'm going to be working all over. And when I've tried using paper towels, I usually find some debris somewhere down in my boot when I'm done. And with, the, with these, they actually really hang together. They're rough and tough enough to take some abuse. You know, your kids are going to be out pounding these things around. I couldn't find one of these when we were building a house, so I grabbed one of Kevin's diapers. And uh, I slit that, poked it all in. And you know the, those little tape, th tape doodads wrapped right around my, my knee? I had an infection in there, and it taped it up real great. Worked real fine. Um, I was a little embarrassed when it fell off in the lumber yard. <coughs> uh, people kind of were wondering why I had this black ooky mess in a diaper hanging around my ankle. <laughs> I didn't spend a lot of time in public with that at the moment. Now you're going to notice that our salve actually turned into salve while we were doing the, the poultice. It has cooled. Very nice emollient salve. And you can make these at home. And if you make them the right consistency, you can actually make things like lip cream, make your own chapstick, all that type of thing. Send that over there and everybody can get a chance to poke their fingers in it. Now I'm going to be trying to get rid of a few things here as we go so that I don't have quite so many things in my way. Let's do some capsules. You know how much fun it isn't to make capsulated herbs by hand or you're trying to scoop the, the two ends together and, and put it back together and all that kind of thing. You know, you can do about 15 of them an hour or whatever. It's, you know, it's frustrating. Here's a little device that we call cap them quick. You can make 50 at a time. Some people are better at this than others. My daughters can make about 50 of them about every five minutes or less. Uh, it takes me a little longer. In fact, I don't know, sometimes I think they maybe can even do it quicker than that, but they're very ambidextrous with both hands. I'm not. I'm rather clumsy. So I'm going to take some powdered herb. Cut and sifted doesn't work too well with this, but powder does. Now before the program, I actually took some capsules and took them apart and filled part of this up. Now, I'll hold this up to where we can see it. All these little holes are kind of like little barrels. And we'll take our, our little capsule apart. We'll drop the top in one, one container. I'm going to poke that down inside there, and it falls just through. You notice this little top is setting up on some, some little stops that hold it in place. I'm going to take my spoon. I'm going to get out some powdered herb. I'm going to drop it on there. Now you can spend a, a lot of time trying to stir that around with your, your spoon, but there's a good use for plastic cards. And this is one of them. One of them is getting yourself in trouble financially, but this one is, I think, a safe use. And you just scrape it around until you have filled up all the little holes. And this is something that the, uh, the commercial people don't do. You're going to get your money's worth. What's the Bible verse? You know, pressed down, shaken, or whatever. Just scrape that together. Now, I'm going to just turn the little stops and pop. That drops down. And now all of my filled capsule halves are exposed. And now for people who don't have clumsy fingers, this is just a real piece of cake to snap these little tops on. I have clumsy fingers and I have a hard time doing this. My fingers are clumsier after I had a bad car accident than they were before. And sometimes I have to talk to my fingers everything that I do. Whoa! 
but especially women and, and kids, they got really great little fingers and they can do these things really, really quickly. And this will ex expedite your pill making procedures or your capsulating procedures a lot. Hope the close up doesn't show how many of these tops I'm scattering all over the place. Now I want to tell you something about these. These are vegetarian ca gelatin capsules. If you don't specify these, you're probably going to get capsules that are made out of uh, moo, cluck, and whinny. Uh, you don't know what kind of an animal they're going to be boiled down out of. And in this day and age, it's not safe to be eating animal products. You're a sitting duck for prion diseases and retrovirus diseases eating any kind of animal products. They're more expensive, but they're made out of vegetable cellulose gum. And if you're specified veggie cap, that's what you have. They're a tiny bit more brittle, uh, and they might be damaged a little easier. And some experts try and tell us that they don't uh, absorb or break down, melt as quickly as, uh, as other capsules. But I don't know, you know, they melt in your mouth before you can get them down sometimes. So I'm not sure how valid that, that complaint that they have is for us. Let's say that you have some herbs that you went out and gathered yourself and you want to grind these things up and you want powder, how are you going to do that? These little seed mills, and you can buy these at almost any kind of a discount store. There are, some people call it a seed grinder, some people call it a coffee, coffee mill. We'll put some of this herb. Now this is not something you want to put heavy bark or heavy roots into. Uh, or really, really hard, hard, uh, like nuts and that type of thing. Some nuts and seeds will, will do that, but some won't. Now here I have a cut and sifted. This is some blue vervain. It's cut and sifted, but I can't make capsules out of this. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to really have a hard time trying to make any capsules out of this one. So I'm just going to grind this up. And I think the typical price for that is about 19 bucks somewhere in that, in that price range. Now I know you're supposed to leave it on the table, but when I do this, I get a lot more thorough grind. There's no moving parts exposed out here, and as long as I'm holding my finger down on the top, I'm quite safe to shake this thing. <clears throat> Otherwise, some of the solids are gonna sit on the bottom and the little blade's not gonna hit them. And you can hear that I'm, you know, heavy things are rattling around in the lid, and as time goes on, it's slowing down. I have less and less heavy things. You're not hearing the impact as much. Sounds like a police car. I'm tempted to just top, pop the lid. If I did, a little genie's uh, going to pop out of the bottle there. And when you deal with herbs a lot, it might be a good idea to get yourself a particle mask. Because sometimes if you're, if you're doing this a lot, like the nervines, they'll deaden the olfactory nerves so you don't smell anymore for a while. I had a friend who said he couldn't smell for about six months because he did a whole bunch of nervines one after the other. Wow. Okay, there's just a little bit of powder that came out of there, but not anything too significant. We'll pour this out here so that people can see what we have. Okay, we have a powder. And that's powder down enough that I could make capsules out of that. Most of the things that I buy, I buy as a powder just to expedite that. But you know, one of these days we're not going to be able to buy things, and that's why I want people to be able to use um, things that they can find in their own backyard or in the area that's close to them. Well, maybe I can't buy capsules. Does that mean I can't take my herbs? Well, I'm going to show you how to make some pills. I'm going to take some powdered herb, bring out my spoon, now, if you're going to be doing this, you know, make it worth your while and make a few. I'm just making a small batch for, for a demo. This is slippery elm bark. Remember I said it was a good binder? I'm going to mix one-third slippery elm 
and two-thirds of whatever of the herb is that I want in a pill. And I'm going to add just a small amount of water. I'm going to try to add a small amount of water. <laughs> I hope I don't have a deluge here and wash it all away. Okay, that looks like about right. Now I'm, I'm using a little plate here. Normally I would use a bowl to do this in. I'm using a little plate so that someone can, you know, with a the camera, they can actually see, and for, for you that are in the studio, that you can see what we're doing here. <clears throat> and I'll mix this up. I've got a third of slippery elm and two, th like one, one part of slippery elm, two parts of our herb here. I'm going to need just a tiny bit more water. It's getting a little bit too dry, too fluffy. If you wanted to do this and, and make so they're a little more pleasant to get down, you could add maybe just a tiny bit of um, corn starch and just a tiny bit of uh, sugar or honey or something uh, to try and make them a little bit sweeter so that Junior doesn't go yuck when you pop it in his mouth before he gets his juice up there to swallow it with. And now you are going to be doing uh, something just kind of like making cookies. It's kind of like making refrigerator cookies. Uh, you can just roll these off into uh, something about the size of a, a pencil here. I think I had a knife out here somewhere. Well, I ordered one and didn't get one. That's, I must have ordered it from the government. I'm going to break a little piece off and uh, pinch it together, and now I have a pill. Okay? You can make these as big or as small as you want to make them, especially if you're making them for children, you might want to make them a little bit smaller. And you mothers who are used to making cookies, you're going to have a lot better time at this than I am. Mm -hmm. I'm making big pills and I'm making little pills. <laughs> Ladies who make cookies are going to discover that they can be much more uniform at this than I am. Now, what would I do with these? I need to find a way to get them to harden up, and the oven's a good place to do that. Now, we don't want to bake them because we're going to ruin them. Uh, all of our good herb things are going to go off into the universe and, and evaporation, and we're going to lose them. We're going to put them in, and we're going to put them on, like, the warm setting, and we're going to prop the, the oven door open. You could do this... Uh, in a food dryer if you wanted to. But you'd have to, you'd make, the food dryer would have to be pretty warm. That'd be the one of the warmer settings for the food dryer. And bake them down to where they really are good and dry. This may take several hours, you know, four to six hours maybe, to really get them to where they're really dry. How do you know if they're dry enough? Well, if they're not dry enough, they're going to mold in your jar. <clears throat> You're going to put them in a, a tight container and put the lid on to store them so that they don't gain moisture out of the atmosphere and then get ushy on you. You'll take your little spoon, pop your pill on here, and put your next pill down, just like you're going to break an aspirin up to put it in a, something for your dog or whatever. Uh, maybe you don't give aspirins to dog. No, it's cats you don't give as aspirins to. Okay. I'm not a veterinarian, but I remember some of these things. If it crackles and crunches and powders, you're in good shape. If it tries to maintain its structural integrity, Put it back in some more. It's not ready. It's going to mold on you if you don't, don't let it go a little bit longer. These are really handy. This is a little ounce scale. If you're going to be in Europe, a little gram scale. Because if you're going to be working with proportions, many times you want to be able to figure out what your proportions are. Well, I can say, well, I'm going to take a spoon of this and a spoon of that. That's not really all that accurate because I might get more by volume because I don't have a good eye than I would of the other one. And even though it's not always terribly critical, I'd rather use this little scale. Now, if you're going to be selling some of your herbs to your friends, how do you know how much to sell? And sometimes you get formulas that says an ounce of this or two ounces of that. These are handy. I mean, they're very, very inexpensive. You can buy these at almost any household hardware store, and you'll have a, an easier time with that one. One of the things that I wanted to share with you, boy, I'm running out of dishes here. I know, I can dump this into here. I'm good at making messes, but I'm also resourceful. 
Um, before I do that, let's talk about compresses. We talked about poultices. What about compresses? What's the difference between a poultice and a compress? A poultice is where you actually have some physical matter that you're putting on. It's charcoal. It's grated potato. Uh, it's cut and sifted herb that you have heated up and uh, gotten the emolliency out of, like maybe comfrey. Maybe it's a uh, fresh comfrey leaf that you've pulverized and, and macerated all up so that you can actually, you know, get the juicy part on the er, on the plant, of, on your arm or wherever you're going to place it. But what's a compress? Well, a compress is when you take some of your infusion or your decoction and you soak a piece of cloth in that. Let's see if I can get my sleeve back up here again. And you wring it out so that it's wet but not drizzling off of there. Place that over the site. And now with this one, I would put a something plastic over the top of this little area. Maybe a piece of plastic bag, piece of saran wrap, uh, wax paper if you have nothing else. And then I'd go right back to my good old nearly destroyed ace bandage to cover this back up again and hold it there. And that will be drawing or it will be uh, depositing in sort of a time release fashion whatever herb it is that you want to place into that area. The last thing that I want to do is I want to show you how to make boluses. This is my least favorite job of all. And somehow it is, and I don't know how, me with the clumsiest fingers in the family, I'm the one who gets roped into making these. I can make these faster than anyone else, and I can't understand it because my fingers are clumsy. I don't. Maybe it's because nobody wants to make them. <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> well, let's say that I made a salve. Um, what's a bolus for? Bolus, B-O-L-U-S. Sometimes we try to get some type of an herb into the body, into one of the cavities, either vaginally or rectally. Uh, on men, sometimes we're able to access uh, or gain entry near the prostate, or perhaps uh, we're trying to get uh, a bolus in the area of some uh, hemorrhoids, or who knows what we're trying to get it in there for. Uh, and women, I do this primarily for women because many times we have like uh, small tumors, we have uh, cysts, uh, uterine cysts, uh, uterine tumors, that type of thing. I can get some very potentially powerful herbal blends into that area right next to the site. I'm not have, having just to rely on the fact that we're drinking some tea or we're taking some tincture or we're taking some capsules or some pills. I'm getting some things right there. I'm not having to rely on something out here. I can get at it. Like I said, I wish sometimes the Lord would have given me a few more zippers to work with on people so I could get things a little closer sometimes. But we do the best that we can. I make up some salves sometimes that are very, very uh, powerful for fighting tumors. And I've had ladies tell me that they've actually had pieces of the tumor begin to attach to the boluses as they begin to pull them out. I was rather amazed when one lady told me that she pulled something out with her bolus that had appendages on it, and she took it to a doctor who identified it as a uh, living breathing microorganism uh, of parasitical nature. And she is quite thrilled at the reduction in the tumor size. And I don't know what all that had to do with that, but I want to show you how to do that. Since I don't have any salve made up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to do that. Here's, here's here. Oh, we've got that salve. Let's here's use here. that. OK. Forgot to take my herbs from my memory. <laughs> Okay, that's just about right for the amount. And a lot of times I want to have like two spoons or two knives or two somethings because this stuff, you don't want to get it all over you and you don't want to contaminate it either. And so I'm going to take this and place, I have a piece of, a, a piece of gauze, like a piece of four by four gauze. 
and I'm going to roll this out and I'm going to make it sil cylindrical in shape. And now I'm going to roll this gauze up. Now I, I cut this specifically so that I don't have a lot of material. The more material, the more I'm going to block my herb from reaching what I'm trying to get at. So I'm going to take a piece of string and I'm going to tie this end shut. And I'm going to tie it twice because I don't want it to open up during use. Okay, that's got that end, and of course you want both ends tied shut. I'm going to tie the other end shut. I'm going to tie it twice again. Now with clumsy fingers, this is, I guess, was one of my least favorite jobs. And I want to leave. Notice what I have now. You see the shape of this. I don't want to cut this off. I want to leave this on. Because I want some way to get at this thing and get it out of there again when we want to when we want to begin the hygiene phase of cleaning. Otherwise, without that, you're going to have a job of locating and, and removing and retrieving it. So you leave this string on and make certain your your knots are well tied, double knot everything. I pop these into the refrigerator or to the freezer so that it will stiffen them up so that it aids. Uh, in the insertion. Now usually I will come over here and I'll clip this extra fluffy end off of here that really does nothing. Wish there was a herbal method of sharpening scissors quickly. Well, there we go. I usually pack these up in about 30 in a box because they're, they're a one a day and we put them in the freezer or the refrigerator. Now to insert these you can use vegetable glycerin. You could use a little bit of olive oil to coat them to, to ease the, insert, the insertion on these. Let's say you don't have that. You can take your cocoa butter and mix your herbs into this. And you could either do it with an, a little bit of infused oil. Uh, you could use uh, some tincture. Or you could use a regular herbal powder and mix into your cocoa butter and then you know melt it add a little bit of wax or paraffin but not a lot to stiffen it up just a little bit more and then you can cool that off and you can actually take these out and form these into your own suppositories you can make your own suppositories didn't know that hey this is really handy stuff you can make all kinds of things at home that you normally wouldn't realize were available to you and these, again, you put in the refrigerator or the freezer so that they really harden up. It keeps them from going rancid, gets them, keeps them from going stale. And of course, again, it really aids in their insertion. And you know, many times with infants, a suppository is about the only thing we've got towards getting something that's time release or sustained release into them because they're going to fight us up here. But you know, rectally, we've got an opportunity to, to deal with it. Well, friends, I've gone through the whole gamut of all of the stuff I had littered all over the table here. It's, it's really easy to do these things. You can make all of these things at home. One of these days we'll want to be able to do all these things. Maybe we're a little bit too busy to do all of these things right now ourselves. But as time goes on, this knowledge will become more and more valuable to us. And I hope that this is an interesting but a very practical aspect of herbology.